Good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to read the second half of chapter four of Alchemy by Marie-Louise von Franz. And uh, this is a very interesting part because it refers to how alch alchemy and some aspects of alchemy came uh, via Muslims from Hyderabad, India. And uh, so it's worth paying attention to. I think that now we can go on to an Arabic text by a man named Muhammad ibn Umayl al-Tamini. It is sufficient to speak of Muhammad ibn Umayl because al-Tamini, the Taman, refers to the specific Isla Islamic tribe to which he belonged. He lived from about 900 to 960, that is, at the beginning of the 10th century, according to our dates. One of his writings has been published in Arabic in the Memoirs of the Asiatic Society of Bengal, which was printed in Calcutta in 1933. Hi, Art. Good afternoon. According, uh, which was printed in Calcutta in 1933, according to a manuscript Mr. Stapleton found in Hyderabad. Stapleton states that there are another hundred or so manuscripts by the same author in Hyderabad with most interesting and promising titles, such as The Pearl of Wisdom, The Hidden Lamp of Alchemy, and so on. But if you write there and inquire about them, you get no answer. Since the 12th century or the beginning of the 13th century, this man has been famous in European alchemy. The writing I am going to present to you was translated into Latin at the end of the 12th or the beginning of the 13th century, and has become one of the most famous medieval writings in the Latin alchemical world. In these Latin texts, his name is given as Senior or Senior. And until 1933, nobody knew who Senior was. Even the famous J. Ruska asserted most authoritatively that Senior was not an Arab, that that was a Latin misrepresentation. But one should never believe Ruska for he is always a doubter, and he, has com he was completely wrong in his contention that it was mistakenly taken to be an Arabic text. Now we have the original and know that the name Senor is simply the Latin translation of the Sheikh, which actually means the old man and explains how Muhammad ibn Umayl came to be called Senor. This Latin text was published under the title De Chemia, meaning that it is about chemistry, but the real Arabic title is, quote, silver water and starry earth, unquote. The Arabic text is given on one side and the Latin on the other, so it is possible to compare one with the other. The Latin translation is quite correct and deviates only in minor details. After Mohammed ibn Ubayl had left the country, his best friend was burned as a heretic, being a Shiite. In the Islamic world, the Sun Sunnis were the official sect and expressed roughly the split between them and the Shiites was due to the fact that the latter had a more symbolic and mystical interpretation of the Quran. For instance, they did not take the Quran literally, but allowed for symbolic interpretation, while the Sunnis insisted on literal obedience to the rules and on its literal truth. The Shiites developed an extensive mystical system of symbolic interpretation and in that way could be compared to the mystics of the Middle Ages, who also tried to interpret the Bible in a symbolic way in contrast to other tendencies. 
You can make the comparison with the parallel split between the Talmudic and Kabbalistic trends in the Jewish tradition. The Shiites would correspond to the Kabbalistic tradition, the true introverts who were more directed towards a psychological symbolic interpretation and personal experience of the religious truth in contrast to the literal minded people who rather insisted on dogma and the holy text. I will give you the Arabic text just as it is in all its complexities as I did with the Greek text so that you may get the full impact and strangeness of this kind of literature. Quote, I and my dear Ubel, the ending is feminine, entered the barba. Barba means beard. And of course, everybody said that one could not enter a beard. Nobody knew what to say about the word, but it simply stands for berba pyramid, which was obviously something the translator had not understood, thereby causing a lot of confusion. I entered the birba and a certain subterranean house, and afterwards I and El Hassan, that is Hassan, saw all the fiery prison, prisons of Joseph, and I saw on the roof the nine painted eagles with their wings expanded as if flying and with their feet open and in the talons of each eagle was a big bow such as is also used by those who shoot with the bow on the walls of this house at the left and right of the main of the man entering i saw the images of human beings standing about they could not have been more perfect or beautiful or had more beautiful clothes in all colors. They had their hands extended toward the center of the room and were looking at the center stat certain statue in the middle of the room near the wall of the inner chamber and which was facing them. The statue was represented sitting on a throne similar to the doctor's throne and on that the statue sat with on its lap over its arms and with expanded, expanded hands over its knees, a marble plate, which was extracted from it, bracket, from what is not known, close bracket, in the length of one arm and as broad as one hand, and the fingers of the statue were clasped over the edge of the tablet, which it held, which it held. The tablet had the appearance of an open book facing the person who entered as if the statue wanted to show it to him. That sounds complicated, unquote. That sounds complicated, but it simply means that there was a seated statue at the back of the room holding a tablet over which its fingers were clasped outwards. And it looked like an open book, which apparently it wanted to show to the person who came in. Quote, in that part of the room in which the statue sat were images of infinite things and letters written in a barbaric language, bracket, which simply means a language not Arabic, close bracket. This tablet one saw in the lap of the statue was divided by a line in the middle, which separated the two sides. On the lower part was the image of two birds bent over each other, one of which was wingless and the other winged, and each held in its beak the tail of the other. Okay, there's, all right, there's the image. Looked at schematically, the birds would be lying one over the other, each with its head to the tail of the other bird, one being winged and one and the other wingless. It was as though they wanted to fly together or as though the wingless one was keeping the other back. That is, the upper bird wanted to carry away the lower 
but the lower bird held it back and prevented it from flying away. The two birds have bound, were bound together, were homogeneous and of the same substance, and they were painted in one sphere as through the image of two things in one. Near the head of the flying bird the, and above it, the sun and moon were represented. This was near the fingers of the, of the statue and in the other part of the tablet, that is to the right, was another sphere of rat or round object facing the birds. And as the whole, and as a whole, there were five time rhythms, that is also something which is unexplained, namely below the birds and the sphere. Above this sphere is the image of the moon and another sphere. On the other side, near the fingers of the statue, is the image of the sun, which emits its rays like the image of two in one. Opposite is an image of the sun with one ray falling downwards, and together that would make three, namely the two planets, the sun and the moon, and the ray of the two in one. And from the ray, one part goes down and reaches into the lower part of the tablet surrounding the black sphere and divided by its surrounding sphere, which together makes two, th two, three, and the third. What is clear from the above is that the sun and moon is, are beside each other with the moon facing on the right and the sun on the left, and below is the black sphere which the, ray, which the rays penetrate. The third was the form of a waxing moon, the inner part of which is white without blackness, but it is surrounded by a black sphere, and the form is like the form of two in one with a simple sun, and that is the image of one in one, and those are again five, and together they make 10, according to the number of the eagles and the black earth. I have now told you all this and have written a poem, and without the grace of God, whose name be blessed, we should not have this secret, so that you may understand and think well about it and meditate on it. I have painted for you in the, the image of the tablet, what and what the images are will be explained in my poem and afterwards you can look at the chapters and see what each figure meant now i have already explained these 10 figures and i have shown the figures in my poem and certainly one could not do without my poem which i want to manifest to you something which all the wise men have hitherto hidden who produced this statue in, the, in this house in which the whole science is described in a symbolic figure teaching us wisdom on this stone and displaying it to those who can understand. I know that this statue was the figure of a wise man, Bracken. This statue represents Hermes, so it means Hermes invented the science and drew the figures close bracket. We now have to find out what this all me means. The statue is the figure of a wise man, and on his lap is the occult science, which he describes by means of symbolic figures, so as to direct the one who knows and understands. The wise who understand it must look at the inner with subtlety, and must know the terms of wisdom and must understand an obscure and symbolic language. When, uh, when he then compares such obscure language with our images, then he will open the one from the other and will become the ruler of the secret stone. Then follows another part which has a new title, letter from the sun to the waxing moon. This, is, this, as you will see, is a love letter. Quote, 
in great weakness, I give you light from my beauty till I have reached perfection. The sun will be exalted to the high, greatest height. First, the moon says to the sun, quote, you need me as the cock needs the hen, and I need your works, O sun, without interruption, because you are of perfect character, the father of all lights, the high light, the great master and Lord. I am the waxing moon, moist and cold, and you are the sun, warm and dry. When we have united in an equality of the status of our house, in which nothing else happens except that the heavy has the light with it, in which we shall will stay, then I shall be like a woman who is open to her husband. And that is true in word. And when we have been united, staying in the belly of this closed house, then I will receive by flattering you your soul and you will take away my beauty and through your closeness i will become thin and we will be exalted in the spirit in a spiritual exaltation or heightened in a spiritual exaltation when we go up in the order of the shakes or the old men the glowing substance of thy light will be united with my light and you and I will be like the mixture of wine and sweet water, and I will stop my flow afterward. afterwards. I will be wrapped up in your blackness, and that will have the color of black ink. But after your dissolutions and my coagulation, when we have entered the house of love, my body will coagulate, and I will be in my emptiness. That... It, unquote. That probably means the moon has completely waned, i.e. it is the new moon. To this the sun replies, quote, if you do this and if you do me no harm, O moon, and if my body will return, then I will give you a new virtue of penetration, and after this you will be powerful in the battle of the fire of liquefaction and purgation, and there will be no longer any diminishing or darkness as it is with the copper and the lead, and you will not fight me and more because you will anymore because you will not be rebellious anymore. End quote. The sun therefore says, if you will do me no harm in this conjunctio, for the moon might harm the sun. Then I will make you powerful in the battle of the fire, and then you will not be corruptible anymore as the copper is, and you will not fight me. The sun later because you were, the sun later because you will have no rebellious feelings anymore. So the moon, which is characterized by waxing and waning and being hostile to the sun and as being dark and corruptible, will lose all those negative qualities and become a solid light as the sun is. The sun continues, quote, blessed is he who thinks about my words. My dignity will not be taken away from you and will not become cheap as a lion will not become cheap. Being weakened by the flesh, the lion is here another image of the sun but if you follow me, then I will not deny you to, or take away from you the increasing of the lead, but then my light will be extinguished and all my beauty will be extinguished, but they will take from the copper of my pure body and from the fatness of the lead by verifying it in, a syllog in the syllogism of their weight but without goat's blood. And then one will make a distillation between what is false and what is true. I am the hard, dry iron. I am the strong ferment. Every good thing is in me. The light of the secret of secrets is generated through me. And every active thing is my action. What has light, what has light, 
I'm sorry. What, ha what has light is created in the darkness of the light. Everything that shines has been created in the darkness. But after I have been led to perfection, I will continue from my illness and from my weakness. And then will appear that great liquid from the head and the tail. And those are the two qualities and the 10 orders of weights, five of which are without darkness and five of them are shining in beauty." Unquote. That is, the end, uh, that is the end of the letter. After this, Senior promises to give an explanation, but the text just goes on in the same way. The explanation he gives is simply what we could call an amplification, a very meaningful one, it is true, but still not an explanation. Actually, we know that Muhammad ibn Umayl was one of those damned robbers who broke open pyramids and investigated the inner coffin chambers. In those times, the, Arabic, the Arabs destroyed a great number of pyramids, stealing all the gold in them. So that nowadays, most pyramids are empty. But Senior or Mohammed ibn, or Mohammed ibn Umayl did not do it as most of the others did, just to find and steal the gold. But because he projected into the death chamber of the pyramids the alchemical secret. He thought, as we discover in the succeeding parts of the book, that the Egyptians knew alchemy and that what was to be found in the innermost chamber of the pyramid was the secret of alchemy. But what was written in the old Eng Egyptian language, he could not read which is why he speaks of a barbaric language. This was before Champollion, as you know. So he thought that in those mysterious hieroglyphic signs was written the secret of alchemy. And as he describes it, as he describes in another text, he found a mummified queen in the gold coffin who had a pair of scissors and little bowls of gold. And he was absolutely sure that that was the queen of alchemy, as it were, the wise prophetess of alchemy, and that the instruments hidden in the coffin of the Egyptian queen were symbolic allusions to the alchemical work. That is one of the strange things of projection into the past. We projected the whole symbolism of the alchemical opus into the mummification. But what is even more interesting is that we know now from what I told you before that actually alchemy did originate from the Egyptian death cult, that the chemistry of mummf mummification played an enormous role that actually the Egyptian mummi mummified their dead in order to obtain immortality and make the dead person divine. And that alchemy tried to do the same. And that alchemy tried to do the same thing, namely produce the immortal man, produce immortality. Therefore, there is, therefore, there is a very good hook for old Senor's projection. He just projected the whole thing backwards into Egyptian mummification, which is why he is so passionately helped to the break, which is why he so passionately helped to break open and destroy the funeral chambers of the pyramids. Naturally, he looked at every, naturally he looked at everything he saw and there tried to find out whether there were allusions to the work of alchemy. Okay, again, this is um, hypnotizing me a bit, so. 
time, you're welcome. Okay, the picture of this statue holding a tablet is a classic topic of many other alchemical texts. It is not specific to senior. You all know from Dr. Jung's lectures on Zarathustra of the Tabula Smaragdina, the Emerald Tablet. It is a classical text of the single sentences of which Jung has given an interpretation so that I need not go into it. The oldest form of such a text was found in the writings of Gabir, which would be in the seventh century. And from the whole of this oldest version of the finding of the tabula, it is clear that the tale goes back to Greek sources. There must have been a Greek story of the Hermes statue found in a tomb, whether <coughs> found in a tomb which had the whole secret on its knees. That story became a topic of alchemical literature in innumerable alchemical writings. For instance, in the Kitab al-Habib, or also the book of Crates, Crates, it always starts off the same way. Quote, I entered the tomb and found a statue with a tablet on which was, unquote, and then follows a kind of explanation. So in this, in seniors time, so in seniors time that had become a theme in literature. That is a parallel to the Emerald Tablet and therefore there are new variations. Senior adds something which I have which I have not found in any of the other tales of the finding of the tablet, namely the nine or 10 eagles, which in the picture shoot at the statue with bow and arrow. He also changed the content of the tablet for, for on it are not sentences of wisdom as, it, as in the others, but two symbolic drawings, the one of two, the one of two birds which try to fly away from each other, and the other of the sun and the moon and the black garden, and that, and that, and, and that, as far as I can see, is Senior's contribution. I was now taking some of the information given in the rest of the book, all of which I cannot read to you. According to it, the eagles represent the sublimated or volatile substance, and therefore something similar to the wife of the steam in, a, in other text. Flying, flying substances like steam and vapor were very often symbolized by birds because they said that these substances had acquired spiritual qualities. The bow and arrow are, the bow and arrow are quite mysterious and are never explained throughout the whole book. So we must either leave them unexplained or give a psychological explanation. Hermes sits surrounded by the nine eagles which shoot at him with bow and arrow. That motif is less skip, is just skipped by Signor in his later explanation of the text. But from the rest of the text, you can make out that the eagles represent the spiritualized substances. Wait. Okay, so that story beca became a topic of alchemical li literature in innumerable alchemical writings. For instance, in the Kati Kitab al-Habib, or also the book of Crates, it also starts off the same way. I entered the tomb and found a statue with a tablet 
on which was, and then follows a kind of explanation. So in Senior's time, that had become a theme in literature. That is a parallel to the Emerald Tablet, and there are new variations. Senior adds something which I have not found in any of the other tales in, of the finding of the tablet, namely the nine or 10 eagles, which in the picture shoot at the statue with bow and arrow. He also changed the content of the tablet for on it are not sentences of wisdom as in others, but two symbolic drawings the one of the two birds which try to fly away from each other and the other of the sun and moon and the black sphere that, and that as far as I can see is Senior's contribution. I am now taking some of the information given in the rest of the book, all of which I cannot read to you. According to the eagles represent the sublimated and volatile substance and therefore something similar to the wife of the steam in our other text. Flying substances like steam and vapor were very often symbolized by birds because they said that these substances had acquired spiritual qualities. The bow and arrow, the bow and arrow are quite mysterious and are never explained throughout the whole book, so we might we must either leave them unexplained or give a psychological explanation. Hermes sits surrounded by the nine eagles which shoot at him with a bow and arrow. Let's see if I can give you that again. Maybe I, I delete that, just a sec. No. Oh. No. Sorry, I keep all these straight. And uh, all right, so what I wanna do is give you this uh, figure 31 back so you can see what he's talking about because these are the eagles shooting at him with bows and arrows. And uh, all right, so there it is. Okay, so you can see the eagles shooting from above at him. Okay. Okay, so according to it, the eagles represent the sublimated or volatile substance and therefore something similar to the wife of the steam in our other text. Flying substances like steam and vapor were very often symbolized by birds because they said that these substances had acquired spiritual qualities. The bow and arrow are quite mysterious and are never explained throughout the whole book. So we must either leave them unexplained or give the psych a psychological explanation. Hermes sits surrounded by the nine eagles which shoot at him with bow and arrow. That motif is just skipped by Senior in his later explanation of the text, but from the rest of the text, you can make out that the eagles represent the spiritualized substances. What would you say the bow and arrow represent? Imagine it was a patient's drawing. What would you then say the eagle shooting at Hermes? we have first to amplify the bow and arrow. What does that suggest? Answer, arrows, Dr. Von Franz. Yes, that is the most obvious idea. The little boy Cupid with his awkward arrows and the whole literature of ant antiquity concerning the bow and arrow and how Cupid even sometimes shoots an arrow at Zeus at a very bad moment and gets him in into his power. A bow and arrow would indicate direction. Something is pointed at an object. The libido has been directed just as happens if you fall in love, you are swimming along in the stream of life and suddenly you are shot at. And then you go home and think that woman or man from morning, you think about that woman or man from morning till night. 
suddenly all the libido is directed and concentrated there. Uh, you do not want to think about it, but then you begin to wonder whether you will meet the person tomorrow at the same place and so on, for that's where the energy is. Now, let me give you another image. Okay, so this is, so the king and queen, queen holding eagle and swan, symbols of the volatile spirit, Saturn, whose positive aspects are self-discipline and endurance is in the foreground. Okay. Therefore, you can say that the bow and arrow have to do with the sudden directedness of the unconscious libido. It has to do with the projections of an arrow is for an arrow is a projectile through projection the libido gets pointed it is just the same if you hate someone there is even a saying which questions who is closer to god i believe it is an indian saying uh he who loves him or he who hates him and the answer is the man who hates him because he will think of God even more often and more intensely than the one who loves him. For his bow and arrow are constantly directed. That is the direction of the league libido through projection. You can say that all the dissociated factors of thought and of the soul are now concentrated on what is on this tablet, i.e. round this Around this whole, the whole psychological attention is concentrated. There are the two wings of the tablet, uh, like two parts of the book, and on the other, on the one side is the problem of the two birds, and on the other that of the union of the sun and the moon. Uh, so that was the original drawing, of course. In the old Greek text, that is explained as the head being different from the tail. It makes a marvelous picture if you say that it is one thing, but that there is an inner opposition between the head and the tail. Therefore, there are such sayings as, quote, take the head, but beware of the tail, unquote, or, quote, unless the head has integrated the tail, the whole substance is nothing, unquote. There's a great deal said about the head and the tail and how they should relate to each other. Therefore, it well describes the opposites, which are secretly one. It is a kind of European tagi tu, the yin-yang symbol, the opposites in one. Remark, the eagles give me the impression of having a relation to Apollo, for it is said that they can look at the sun. And of course, Apollo has the bow as, as has the winged boy Cupid, Dr. Von Franz. Apollo is the representative of the principle of consciousness, but that does not contradict the interpretation. Apollo's bow and arrow would refer to the attention given by love the concentration of mental libido through love. According to the scholastic theory of knowledge, you can only get knowledge through love, which means that you only acquire knowledge by loving your subject, by being fascinated by it. Thus, the anima is always behind the search for truth. Okay, now there's, this is another image. Not exactly sure where it fits in the text, but I'm gonna give it to you and then we'll figure it out. So the, the caption is frustrated expectations and desires arising partly from the phenomenon of projection are the basic material of analytical work. The emotional reactions involved in the process of withdrawing projections may be likened to the alchemical image of the salamander as prima materia roasting in the fire. Uh, 
And so I guess as an example of that, we could say that uh, if somebody is projecting something on Hillary Clinton, for example, and then you ask them to withdraw that projection, that person is going to get emotional and say, oh, no, I, I don't think that or whatever. If you have if you have to learn about a subject you do not love, where you have no projection, which means that you have no relationship to it, it does not mean anything to you and is not connected with your flow of libido. So you have to toil and sweat at something and learn it for the exam, but 10 minutes later, you have forgotten it again. If you are fascinated, however, which means that a projection has taken place, then you get emotional and acquire a tremendous amount of consciousness very easily and quickly. That is the whole secret of teaching and learning. You can say that those are simply two aspects of what, as a general description, one might call attention, which is created either by the concentration of consciousness or by love, and behind both is a projection. Fascination always involves projection. Okay, remark. You talk of projection, but these are all archetypal figures. Dr. von Franz, yes, and that raises the question as to whether archetypes project. I think they do. Certainly it is so in our idea of projection. Uh, consider what actually happens. You know quite well that we never make the projection, but that it is done to us. I do not myself project something. That is the way one talks, but it is not true. The fact is that I suddenly find myself in a, in a situation of projecting. And when I have seen that it was a projection, I can begin to talk about it but not before. For instance, someone who has projected the shadow will insist the other person is a rotter and will carry on like that. But perhaps two years later in the course of analysis, he will realize he was projecting his shadow onto the other. Therefore, who projected? That is the great mystery. When the Greeks fell in love, they were modest enough not to say, quote, I have fallen in love, unquote, but expressed it more accurately by saying, quote, the God of love shot an arrow at me, unquote. And that is how it really happens. One suddenly has the painful sting, uh, which one has not made oneself, one finds oneself being shot at. So one can therefore speak of the archetype of the God of love. If you go into the history of Eros, you will find that he is a variation of Hermes. The Eros of antiquity is similar to Hermes Kilenios. Uh, in olden times, when he was a fertility god of Boetia, he was represented exactly like the Priapic Hermes statues. You can therefore say that the Greeks meant a variation of the god Hermes. It is a symbol of the self or of the totality which makes the projection. I think that is correct. If I find myself in a projection situation, that is an arrangement by the self. Okay, and the caption reads, Cupid, Venus, and the Passions of Love by Bronzino. Quote, when X falls in love with Y, an onlooker might call that projection. But as long as there is no uneasiness, I have no right to cut into that participation by calling it projection. That is a horrible, poisonous mistake people constantly make, unquote. Okay, remark. Here the eagle is connected with Eros or with Apollo so that the gods are projecting onto the gods. Dr. Van Franz, yes, you are quite right. And therefore, in general, we can say that it is always the unconscious or some aspect of it which produces the projection. It is the self or a God. It is always a God which produces the projection. 
which means that it is always an archetype. The ego complex does not do it. The next step is to ask what the God of the unconscious projects onto. Usually he projects onto outer objects, either human beings or things. Or can it happen that an archetype projects onto another archetype? I think it can. It is something which occurs frequently, and that would be a process of unification in the systems of religion. Okay, reading on. Take polytheism, for instance. In most polytheistic systems of religion, there is the secret knowledge that they all are all aspects of one God. Even the Greeks knew that. In late Greek Stoic philosophy, it is always said that there is really only one God and that all the other gods, Athene, Hermes, and so on, are only different aspects of that one. So you can say that there is a latent monotheism within Greek polytheism. The same thing happens with the Elohim in Jewish monotheism. When God created the world, he said, quote, let us create, unquote. And it has always been supposed that the us was addressed to the Elohim. So there is also a secret polytheism within monotheism, which also comes in the figures of Malak Yahweh, uh, the angel of God. Sometimes Yahweh uh, interferes himself, and sometimes he sends the Malak Yahweh who is more or less just one aspect of himself. It can be said in general that in any monotheistic system, just as in Judeo-Christianity, there is a secret tendency toward polytheism, which though not quite realized or admitted yet exists, uh, just as in polytheistic systems, there is a secret tendency toward monotheism to ensure that all those many gods are really only different aspects of the one God. If you express that in psychological terms, it would mean that the multitude of archetypal constellations are all really one in the self, although the self actually manifests in practical life very often in single aspects, which we prefer to call different archetypes. Uh, the problem is whether there are many archetypes or if the archetype of the self is really the one archetype. One speaks of a mother complex, but if we go into that, it will always be found that the whole self is in it. An archetypal complex always leads to the symbol of the self. So here again, there is a secret monotheism in the polytheism, uh, whether the stress is on the one or the other. If the many point to one, I would say that in the unconscious, there is a tendency toward putting all the energy into the self and away from the different single archetypes. The many archetypes tend to concentrate around the one archetype, which you could say mirrors the tendency of the unconscious itself towards greater consciousness. It could be said that the eagles are like an assembly of gods gathering around the one God, which psychologically interpreted would mean that many archetypes begin to fall into an order concentrating on the archetype of the self. The archetype of the self begins to be dominant and the dissociation into many archetypes begins to be ordered around a center. It would follow that if a single archetype is dominant in one psyche, let us say the mother archetype or the anima archetype or whatever it may be, then there is a certain amount of one-sidedness in that person. It is only when the archetype of the self really begins to carry the process uh, that the thing becomes unified and everything falls into place. Uh, I would say in fact that the sense of unity is a symbolic representation of that moment when the many archetypes begin to give their energy to one. Remark, I was thinking of something slightly different, getting a little away from the archetypes and more 
to the primitive religious attitude, such as the experience of God in the tree or the spirit of the tree. The parallel I would see in this case is the following. Perhaps there is a spirit in the tree and the archetypes are being projected onto the tree. So God is really in the tree and the gods are projecting onto God. That is a speculation. Dr. From Franz, yes it is and I cannot answer it. You can believe it or not for such a thing cannot be proved. Actually, that simply touches upon the question as to whether if an archetypal image is really projected, there is also a transcendental reality, which makes the projection. But we have no means of checking such a thing. So it is a question of belief and you can believe it or not. I do believe it, but I do not intend to try to convince anybody because I have no proofs. Remark. If you really get back to the primitive religious attitude and try to analyze it, saying that this is just a projection, then immediately something has been projected and one can only take it on that level. Dr. Von Franz, that is completely wrong. If you read Dr. Jung's definition of projection, he says categorically that you can only speak of projection when doubt has arisen. Therefore, we are wrong if we say that the primitive projects onto the tree. That is our way of talking because we doubt whether God is in the tree and therefore we can say that it would be a projection for us. But since no doubt arises in the primitive, we have no right to speak of his projection. Look at Dr. Jung's sim simple definition of projection in psychological types. And um, all right, there you will read that one can only speak of a projection when doubt has risen and that until the assertion that there is a projection is not legitimate. Only when within myself, I feel insecure, can I begin to speak of projection and not before. Projection implies that I am no longer entirely convinced that I am already in a certain ex to a certain extent out of the participation mix mystique or archaic identity until then there are there is no projection naturally the onlooker doubts which is why if one takes a modern case for instance x falls in love with y the onlooker will call that a projection of the animus uh, but for the reason involved there is no projection. And it would be an analytical mistake to say that there was, that would be infecting the other person with one's own doubt. For X, that man is now the beloved and not simply an image of the animus. If I doubt it because I am not in the same participation, I have no right to poison the other with that doubt. I have to wait until the analysis begins to feel some disquiet, until the man she loves does not behave as she expected he would. Once this state of disquiet is manifested, I can say that perhaps she has projected onto that man something within her. But as long as there is no uneasiness, I have no right to cut into the participation uh, by calling it a projection. That is a horrible, poisonous mistake people constantly make. We no longer believe that trees and animals are gods, but it would be wrong to assert that it is a projection in the case of the primitive. For what to us is projection is the pr pr primitive, the whole experience of reality. It is their truth. If I were to go to Africa and become black myself emotionally, then I would not speak as I used to of the primitives projection. I would say that now I see the primitives are right. God is in the tree. But as long as I stay in Europe and the primitive says God is in the tree while I do not see anything divine about it, in that case, I could speak of projection. The use of the word depends on the state I am in. When I doubt, I can use it. But if there is no doubt in me, 
I cannot and should never use the word to poison another person's reality. Projections die autonomously. Suddenly the thing has disappeared and that happens completely without conscious cooperation. Such things are psychological events per se. Afterward, I can say there was a projection, but that is only a relative and not an absolute truth. Okay, and there's one other image at the end of this chapter, which I will share with you. Uh, okay, so here's the image. It's the, is the Tree Spirit by Margaret J Jacobe. And uh, I'm not real clear about why she included this except to say that what she's saying here is um, if you see a spirit in that, uh, then, okay, that can be your God or a God. But if you don't see a spirit in it, which one wouldn't in the black and white version, um, then you can say such a statement that God is in the tree is a projection. Um, and so hopefully tomorrow I will continue with lecture five. It is in lecture five that some um, wonderful question and answer uh, takes place. And I look forward to reading that for you uh, because Dr. Von Franz points out to a theologian that the theologian thinks his God is dead and settled in the Bible and nothing can be changed, whereas um, Jungian analysts and Jungian people who follow Jungian theory say that God is not dead, God is living. And, um, and that's a significant, significant difference of perspective. So anyway, uh, that's the reading for today. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate seeing you here. Um, so I'm going to conclude.